Today is chapter 13, Achieving Energy Sustainability. So this chapter is more about renewable forms of energy as the last chapter was non-renewable. Well, what is renewable energy? Renewable energy can be rapidly regenerated and some can never be depleted no matter how much we use. Fossil fuels on a human time scale are non-renewable because they've been buried for millions of years, took millions of years to form. Therefore, once we run out, we are running out. And that's why it's more important that we continue to invest monies in technologies for renewable energies. Uh, you see at the top are the four energies that we talked about, uh, or fuels in chapter two natural gas, oil, and coal being fossil fuels, and nuclear being another non-renewable resource, but not considered a fossil fuel. If you look at the next five, excuse me, six choices, potentially renewable would be biomass, and it's potentially renewable because as long as um, the trees for the wood are being replanted or the crops for the biofuel are being replenished as they're being used, then they are renewable. Unfortunately, in Haiti, uh, which I believe was chapter three, they were cutting down all of their trees so quickly and not replanting them, or at least not nearly enough, that they were running out of fuel because, because it's such a poor developing country, they uh, depend on wood for their energy. It was like the Lorax. Non-depletable resources are wind, solar, hydroelectric, and geothermal, and we'll go through all of those. The beginning of the chapter, though, says, how can we use less energy? And we did talk about that a little in class with chapter 12, that you need to be able to find ways to use less. And although the U.S. has been better at getting more efficiency out of our energy, like with the compact fluorescent light bulbs or LED lights, we are still a society that uses a lot of electronic devices and as population increases, we're still using more energy per capita. So conservation is finding ways to use less energy and efficiency is getting the same result but using a small amount of energy. So those compact, compact fluorescent bulbs are much more efficient than a regular incandescent light bulb. Here are ways of being able to conserve energy. I will not read those to you, but there are many things that you can do to reduce your carbon footprint and to reduce the amount of energy. The problem with transportation is, like we talked about in urban sprawl, is that as a city grows and be grows out instead of up, the distances to travel are farther, which means you're going to depend more on fossil fuels to get you where you need to go. And so if a city or town learns <clears throat> to um, build up and have a central area, then you don't have to, to drive everywhere. You could take the public transportation. I noticed that again when I went to Boston recently and up to Cambridge to see Harvard, everything you need is right there. And so there's no need to have a car if it's not absolutely necessary. Um, energy companies have an extra backup of energy to meet peak demands. And peak demands are a lot first thing in the morning when everyone's getting ready to go to work or school. And then after school, when everyone comes home, turns on the TV, turns on the computer and starts cooking dinner. So what companies could do is implement a structure where people who, who choose to use more electricity during off-peak times get cheaper rates and you pay more if you use more energy during peak times. That would hopefully reduce uh, energy use because people don't want to pay more. Another way of energy efficiency and conservation is design and a sustainable design and um, with this typical home in the northern hemisphere you would want to build windows that face the south where the sun's going to be and you could have shades um, 
for when the sun is really high in the sky and to to not let so much sunlight in so then you don't have to to use the AC as much and then also it's lower in the sky in the winter uh, as you see there so then the light can come through and if you use like a concrete or cement floor which I know most of us don't have um, but it absorbs more heat so after the sun has gone down the floor would remain warm and you potentially don't have to use as much heat so sustainable design is improving the efficiency of the buildings This is just showing you a, uh, an array of solar panels on top of the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco to reduce their dependence on fossil fuels for electricity. So the sun is the ultimate source of almost all types of energy. It is the source, the ultimate source for all fossil fuels and it is the source of all renewable energies and you can see from the diagram there how it is responsible. The only two non-solar related energies are uh, nuclear or geothermal energy which comes from inside the earth or tidal energy which is coming from the pole of the moon. We talked about yesterday how in developing countries most people um, depend on sustainable, um, excuse me, subsistence energy so wood charcoal and charcoal is a form of wood just more efficient therefore more expensive um, and biomass from animal manure and most of them just use it for their their own energy needs so people would say well how does burning biomass like wood better than burning coal if coal came from plant matter as well well, the carbon that is in the biomass, the, like the wood or the charcoal, was in the atmosphere not so long ago as carbon dioxide that was taken in by the tree. So when we burn it, we release that CO2 back into the atmosphere. The thing is, is that it was more recent. Burning coal is burning carbon that was buried for millions of years. So it was not in circulation in the atmosphere recently. And so what happens is then when you burn it, you're adding all that CO2 at once back into the atmosphere. So with burning biomass, the theory goes that if you burn biomass that has been in the atmosphere recently and you return it, <coughs> excuse me, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought for a second. So um, if we burn biomass and release that CO2 from recent carbon but we allow those plants and trees to grow back where we removed them then eventually those new plants will take in the CO2 that we put back into the air by burning it so the theory goes that it would end up being carbon neutral there you see biomass wood charcoal and manure used to heat homes throughout the world three million homes still use these in the US which kind of surprised me um, but I guess when you have 320 million people, 3 million is not very much. Ethanol and biodiesel are biofuels. Um, ethanol mostly comes from corn in the U.S. And, um, uh, and it is used for a substitute for gasoline or diesel. And it's the ethanol is the same stuff that you find in alcoholic beverage. So what they do is they get the plants, such as corn, and convert those um, starches and sugars into alcohol. So what's good about ethanol is that it uh, keeps farmers growing crops, which is good, so it keeps them employed. Um, but in order to harvest it, you're still using fossil fuels in order to get it together. Um, where was I? Ethanol. Oh yeah, flex fuel vehicles, if you've seen those on the road, can run on either gasoline or E85, which is a um, ethanol and gasoline mixture. 
But the problem is, is that a lot of people just put regular gasoline and don't have access to the E85. The, the only other problem with the bio, excuse me, the ex, uh, ethanol for flex fuels is that um, it's actually a little bit less efficient and so you're having to fill up more. Here is a picture of um, a guy in the Philippines who sells charcoal to homes. We saw that in that um, video about China that charcoal is something that's often burned for heat and for cooking. The problem with that is that when you burn wood or charcoal inside and in non-ventilated areas, you are much more at risk for um, lung disease and or cancer because of all the particulate matter. It's still, charcoal is still a dirty fuel to burn. It's just more efficient than wood and it's much, much cheaper than a fossil fuel. And the second picture of the forest is showing an area where um, they cut down trees in order to produce charcoal. And I've mentioned before that charcoal is made basically by slow cooking wood. And you take all the water and other nutrients out and all you're left with is the black leftovers. Well, that's carbon. All right, so let's get to the renewable resources. Hydroelectricity is just like what it sounds like, electricity generated by the kinetic energy of moving water and is the second most common form of renewable energy in the world, biomass being number one. So how does it work? Um, basically, it works like a coal or nuclear power plant, except you're not burning any fuel. So what happens is if it's free flowing water over a dam and falling down, um, it, the, the faster it falls and the higher it falls means, well, especially from a, a higher height, means it has greater potential energy, which means it can have greater uh, kinetic energy. So the faster the water is moving, which is the flow rate, um, or the height of the dam for which it's falling over, um, will increase how much electricity you get. The largest dam in the U.S. is the Grand Coulee Dam in Washington State and the largest dam in the world is the Three Gorges Dam in uh, China. <coughs> Excuse me. So again, with the um, other power plants, the flow of the water, the kinetic energy that we get from the water is what turns the turbines, which turns the generator, which generates electricity. So again, the plants or the, elect the electricity generation is very similar between renewable and non-renewable. You're just not burning a fossil fuel. Run of the river systems are not nearly as, they're, they're efficient, but they're not as big as dams and they're not stored water. It's not a, a run, sorry, run of the river systems do not have water that is stored behind the, um, uh, dam for long periods of time. Tidal systems, this tidal energy is not widely used. Um, there is a big system in Roosevelt Island, New York, so if you read the introductory story, that uses the rise and fall of the tides to create energy and it works the same way. The movement of the water in and out turns the turbine, which turns the generator to generate electricity using solar energy. Solar energy can be captured actively or passively. In that sustainable design for a house, you're using the energy passively in that you're not concentrating the um, sunlight to create electricity as you do in active solar energy. Um, in active solar energy, you could have photovoltaic solar cells that collect the light from the sunlight and convert it into electricity. The problem with that right now is that it's still a relatively expensive, um, sorry, my phone rang, I had to push pause. Um, the problem with solar energy is that it is still rather expensive and so more money needs to be invested to get um, the technology to be cheaper. And, and you're using semiconductor materials which some use um, rare metals and you have to use fossil fuels in order to produce those cells. So of course with any um, energy source there's going to be energy used and for instance with the dams 
yes, there there is environmental destruction there because you're um, destroying habitats. And if you have water that is stored behind a dam in a reservoir, that tends to have less oxygen. It tends to heat up or retain more heat, which uh, can be harmful to some species. So you can't win 100% even with renewable energies. There's going to be uh, pros and cons. Here you see a giant solar array, which is a lot of solar cells that are concentrated and it is able to heat water to make steam and that steam what does it do turns the turbines which turns the generator which generates electricity geothermal energy comes from inside the earth and as we learned with convection cells in the earth there's radioactive decay so those radioactive uh, elements are decaying into their parent uh, blah, blah, radioactive parent isotopes are decaying into their daughter isotopes and um, from that comes heat so the heat then will from inside the earth will heat up groundwater and that groundwater then as it's heated up can be used you know as it produces steam to turn the turbine to turn the generator to generate electricity and you can pause at any time if you want to keep looking at those diagrams Wind energy, um, which the U.S. is using more of, is simply using a wind turbine to, to convert the kinetic energy of air into, elec into electrical energy. The U.S. has the largest wind energy generating capacity in the world. Most of those are on the West Coast and some in West Texas where it's, it's desert and windy. Um, and new projects are including offshore wind parks where they're building giant wind turbines in the ocean. Of course there are going to be negatives as there always are um, in that um, you know birds can be uh, killed as they do run into the blades unfortunately and they are not really that aesthetically pleasing um, and they're really big. They are very expensive to construct, which is one reason why people are nervous about them, but needs not so much upkeep once they are built. So just like with um, water and geothermal, the wind turns the blade, which turns the turbine, which turns the generator, which generates electricity. And so wind is never ending. Again, the only other negative is that you need to be in a windy area. So if you're in, you know, a non-windy area, then uh, wind energy is not going to be a choice. Fuel cells. We all know that what batteries are. It has chemical energy going on inside because you have two chemicals, I think it's nickel and cadmium, that are reacting together. Well, once those reactions have been used up, the battery dies, you throw it away. But in a fuel cell, the reactants are added continuously so that the cell produces electricity continuously. In a hydrogen fuel cell, notice that when you um, react hydrogen with oxygen, you get energy and water. So there are no uh, air pollutants as a result. The problem that scientists are having is that free oxygen, excuse me, free hydrogen is rare and then you know it is explosive. It is not uh, very stable as it binds to a lot of other elements. Um, it is 80% efficient, so it, it is a great potential resource for the future, and hydrogen-fueled vehicles could be sustainable because hydrogen-fueled cars would use an electric motor, and electric motors are more efficient than internal combustion engines that use gasoline. So if the technology comes and we have a good way of being able to get hydrogen and and be safe and not explosive, you could potentially have an, a, a vehicle that could be fueled by a renewable source of energy such as a hydrogen cell that is carbon neutral because you're not using any and then also pollution free. And this diagram is showing you how it would work in a vehicle. Uh, this chart is the uh, chart that you'll need to fill out in class that has the advantages and disadvantages and what pollutants. Do pay attention to what pollutants and emissions come from all of these sources um, and you can also get it at the end of chapter 3 in your book.